I, I'm kind of sitting with all of these wonderful artists, and I, I feel like a bit of an imposter um, speaking with some, some expert fiber artists here. My background is in painting and drawing, and I'm somewhat new to the fiber arts, so really I would consider myself a painter who uses fibers as a material. Um, the images I'm gonna show you are all paintings and embroideries on silk, both crepe de chine and raw silks, and I will also show you some of my drawings. I'm just gonna get my cursor back, there we go. So I've spent the last nine or so years really honing my craft in this traditional silk painting and batik processes, and I could chain stitch my way out of hell, but I couldn't do anything on a sewing machine, okay? So I stand before you as a junior varsity fiber artist, <laughs> humbled in your presence, um, so this talk, I promise, is going to be about my work, but it's mostly going to be an opportunity for me to talk about some of my favorite artists and some of the weird kind of things that I look at on the internet and in life um, and some random digressions, so please bear with me. Um, I want to start by talking about where ideas begin and how I kind of source information and imagery and then filter them into my art practice. Um, I grew up in a household of artists. These are my parents. They're both landscape painters. Um, so images, materials, kind of idea gathering was really instilled in me at an early age, and I learned from watching my parents how to gather and collect imagery and inspiration. In addition to a painter, um, my mother is also an embroiderer, so she taught me, she taught me her, her craft. Um, these are artist portraits from a series she did called Women in Stitches, a famous female identifying artist, and another series of female identifying activists. So she both taught me how to embroider, and that embroidery with the act comes with the act of patience, that art takes time, and that the act of making is embedded into our daily lives. I am going to show as just like a content advisory warning some medical illustrations, if that makes anyone uncomfortable or queasy, that they're coming up next. Okay. Um, my first love was medical illustrations, spoiler. Um, I'm drawn towards representations of figures. I am particularly interested in ways we categorize or organize bodies, often in fragments, where parts must make up a whole, creating visual dissections. I like the strangeness of the body and the abstractions that occur when pieces become isolated or removed from context. This is one of my favorite installations of all time at the Motor Museum in Philadelphia. If you ever are in Philadelphia, you should absolutely go here. Um, it's a wall of wax replicas of eye diseases. And there's something really beautifully horrifying about these. These once individual nameless sitters quartered and reduced to this abstracted grid. This from a Japanese book of skin diseases. Here the makers have embossed the pox directly into the paper. So the paper becomes this literal tactile skin. And I love these and medical illustration in general because despite the content, the technique and mastery of the material is incredibly beautiful and skillful. These are more from a book on skin diseases. And again, just utterly gorgeous representations of really awful things. And I'm drawn to the cropping of the bodies in these, the focus on pattern, color, where skin can dissolve into abstract painting. And individual identity doesn't matter here. Rather, the intricacies of the surface, the color, the scale is the forefront of the image. I discovered this um, kind of painting series recently. These are um, Japanese paintings called Kusozu that were done between the 13th and 19th centuries. Um, they're traditionally watercolor paintings on either paper or silk. And the Kusozu paintings depict the nine stages of death and decay. It's the first one. These were hung in Japanese temples so that Buddhist followers could meditate on the impermanence of their bodies and the cycle of life and death. These figures were most often of women, so the decaying female form was also a way to suppress sexual, sexual desires in men. I'm interested in the duality housed in these images, that these depictions of death could be beautiful reminders of our own bodies and yet also use the, the destruction of the female form to quash desire. They are both poetic and puritanical. But ultimately, I love these because that art in this instance was used not to transcend the viewer's worldly life. It wasn't sublime, but rather forced the viewer to turn inward and contemplate their own physical presence. So now jumping many centuries, I love how these ideas persist and shift in, into a contemporary context. Here are the artist Kiki Smith reimagining the broken woman. 
And many of my favorite artists are figurative artists who are subverting the female form and sexuality in both filthy and humorous ways. These are more of Kiki Smith's figurative sculptures and kind of bizarro abject fairy tales. Sarah Lucas is an all-time fave of mine. I've always appreciated her dirty sexuality and filthy feminism. She makes fun of the body and relationships, reducing them to banal objects. Where sexy turns to flimsy and pathetic. And this is something that I am definitely striving for in my work too. Representations of a body that is complicated. Bodies that are both sexy and gross, funny and serious, defiant and pathetic. Bodies that are constantly oscillating between all of these things at once. I also love how artists play with materials within the figure itself to imbue it with emotion, history, and in Toya and Odotola's case, literally charging her seated figures with electricity. Her rendering of skin resembles tight, overlapping muscles. It is raw and kinetic. Similarly, the paintings of, of Amako Boafu treat the skin as an abstract painting in and of itself. But here, Boafu smears the paints across the canvas with his own fingers resulting in an effect that is sensual, intimate, and unruly, bodies that cannot easily be defined. Christina Ramberg is another of my all-time faves. Her work got me really excited about clothing and underwear as, as both a narrative and formal element. And she tells the story of having these really pivotal memories of being a young girl and watching her mother lacing herself up in corsets, garters, and stockings watching her mother's body contort into different shapes as she dressed and undressed. In her work, she played with underwear as both decoration and bondage. I love her cropped bodies and patterns, always teetering on abstraction. And I think of these pieces as I work in my own studio. These are early paintings on raw silk, which I started at a residency in Iceland. And while I am playing with narrative information kind of within the picture plane, like these two bodies kind of crammed together, I'm also thinking about a formal style, you know, where skin and underwear are just broken down into simple shapes, colors and lines moving across the surface. Playing with the body as an abstraction, sorry, these are like really bad photos of these. They're very pixelated, they get better, I promise. Um, playing with the body as an abstraction, shifting sexy to strange, and these are all um, on raw silk with embroidered elements. It's important for me that the figure is shoved up into the image plane. I don't really like backgrounds because I don't want to give these figures any context. I want them to dissolve into something formal, almost like minimalist color field paintings, where underwear and skin just become shapes of color, of texture. And I think about Agnes Martin a lot in my studio her insistence on the square, her simple color palettes, and her obsessive attention to detail and exactitude. Her colors and quiet minimalism somehow, fe somehow feel figurative to me. I've always seen these little lines of like tiny hairs. So even though our content is completely different, I, I do channel her a lot in my studio. She would like roll over in her grave if she saw these together. Um, Man Ray has always been another big influence, and like Christina Ramberg, I respond to his abstraction of the female form, the cropping in of bodies, the use of shadow and light to further manipulate and complicate the surface. And I'm also a big fan, and you'll, you'll kind of see this later on, of borrowing and stealing images. Um, so taking something and transforming it through a different material. So for example, I loved the shadowy lines hugging Lee Miller's body in this Man Ray photograph. And then the knit details kind of similarly accentuating the body um, and curves in the sweater by the fashion designer Mara Hoffman. And it, it kind of turned into this piece. So this is all um, hand embroidered lines on raw silk. And I wanted to play with the transparency and the mapping, kind of the topography of the body through these embroidered lines. I've always loved this like weird Tom Wesselman painting of like the butt tunnel. I think it's just really funny and dumb. And I love me some Morris Lewis, just these like drippy um, kind of oil pigments on a raw canvas. So I kind of brought them together in this piece. 
And I'm a big sketchbook user, so images are always kind of filtered through small th thumbnails first. Um, this from a sketchbook, then maybe later into a more finished drawing, and then perhaps another painting. So there's kind of lots of iterations happening. And I often look back through my medical illustration books for things to borrow or steal. Um, this is maybe one of my all-time favorite paintings from this book of skin diseases. I'm just totally obsessed with how weird this image is, like her, this weird, uncomfortable position and those hair ringlets. And then I have no idea what the UP or the UP stands for, um, but I love it, so I stole it and I changed it. Um, I wanted to keep that kind of weird back text, but for it to read something non-committal or that had multiple meanings. So um, kind of substituting the word up for okay, um, thinking about the difference between, you know, an excited okay, like okay, or something really apathetic, like okay, right? Something that could kind of like live between the two. Um, and similarly, the unhooked bra is a nod both to something sexy or completely mundane, just taking your bra off at the end of the day. And beyond artists and books, I looked at pop culture a lot, Instagram. Um, I found this really great photo of the musician Beth Ditto. I kind of rethought of it as the silk painting. Um, I'm a big advocate of Tumblr. Do people still use Tumblr? It's just me, okay. It's me and like some like 15 year olds. That's cool. Um, this is a selection of my Tumblr blog. Um, it's really become my like sketchbook annex where I can just kind of like quickly gather information, store imagery that I can then return to. Um, this is a sampling. They range from fashion, textile design, stock photography, Houdini, pools, meat. I don't know. Um, this somehow all makes sense when I kind of like filter through it later, but uh, yeah. Sometimes I will take these Tumblr images and directly reference them um, by kind of taking the image and then through the silk and embroidery kind of flatten um, onto the material. So this woman became the silk painting. And I like how when it cropped, it started to look like a weird emoji face or just a collection of strange um, kind of geometries on the surface. This is another Tumblr image of two teenagers making out in a photo from the 1950s. And I just zoomed in there and I translated it to raw silk. So again, kind of zooming in helps me remove any context so the bodies aren't specific. It could be almost anybody. And I've always liked them really spilling over into our space. And then three years later, kind of thinking that same um, image composition, but on a different type of silk. So then translated to the crepe de chine using batik processes and um, exploring pattern. Sometimes ideas are collages of a lot of different images or sources. So I made this Tumblr painting equation for you. So there's bad tattoo plus lace glove plus nipple pincher equals this piece. <laughs> or weird fashion editorial plus jarred prison tattoo became that. I, have, I make myself laugh in the studio. Good, it's important to you. Um, I, I don't discriminate where images come from, so it can be as lowbrow as screenshots from Haynes.com. Maybe you've rethought of as this. Or 17th century paintings of Saint Sebastian. Rethought of as this drawing. So Google and Tumblr are really my playground. Um, it becomes a place where I can kind of source whatever I want and then think about how I can translate it to this, this new material. So here's an allergy test. Some hippie butts. The blank chest, the male chest, becomes a blank canvas for me to play with pattern. So here a heat rash. And then maybe revisiting that rash pattern on another composition. These are all drawings, by the way. These are um, colored pencil and ballpoint pen. And then later returning to the bare chest to reveal another chest. And I really love this idea of the drawing within the drawing. The man is lifting his shirt coyly to reveal a woman in the act of bathing. It's a double nude. And tattoos being another way to depict these drawings within drawings. The body is a surface for other bodies. 
And I've always loved these strange stacking of bodies. Um, I'm really obsessed with these raquette photographs. They're homogenized legs moving wildly from stiff torsos. And similarly, these identical pantyhose legs stacked impossibly in a line. So I thought about how they might look as drawings, adding pattern, cropping in in order to abstract and make more strange, where negative space could become positive space. Disembodied legs seemingly going on forever. And while I often borrow and appropriate images from elsewhere, I often use myself. I'm um, my best sitter. I'm always available and willing to do almost anything for the right shot. Um, <laughs> some things you just can't find or don't want to find on the internet. Um, so this is a, a silk painting, kind of rethought of as a drawing, and another iteration. With these, I wanted to shift the point of view from the viewer from an outside gaze to one of self-reflection, kind of a literal navel, navel gazing that implicates the viewer into my own body. So here's a drawing and then a painting. And on this one, you can kind of see the silk oozing off the sides. I like that it, the body couldn't kind of be contained in its own square. And another drawing iteration and another, this one shifted back to the external viewer. And you might notice I use lace and pantyhose a lot in my drawing. Um, I really like them as, as, you know, simply as a formal element. You know, it's one pattern to kind of further push the abstraction, becomes a scrim of texture and surface to conceal the body. And I also love the architecture or tailoring of pantyhose and tights. This gusset, kind of a wonderful overt stand-in for the female anatomy and such a nice weird shape to break up the monotony of the patterning. And lace, of course, is also a nod to sex and class, an act of dress up and play. It's simultaneously both naughty and innocent. Another piece. And sometimes I just like giving myself visual problems to solve. Um, sometimes it's okay and freeing to give yourself just like a simple assignment. So. For these, I was interested in how I could use the ballpoint pen, you know, something that has like this, you know, permanence with it to make something really delicate and, um, and sheer. So using it to create this sheerness over the figure. So these are two ballpoint pen drawings. And then translated to silk. So this is back on the crepe de chine with the batik processes. And I like, I like working on the silk a lot because it's kind of inherently bodily, especially the crepe de chine. If you've, if you've worked with it before, it, it is just like naturally transparent. So there's something kind of already skin-like about it. Um, you know, we often wear it as clothing or as scarves and when it's stretched, it starts to resemble that kind of transparent skin. So it seems really kind of a natural place to add the body on top of or into. Um, this is a more recent piece. This is all chain stitched embroidery, um, kind of using the chain stitch and the patterning um, within the embroidery to kind of create like another abstracted veil on top of this, this kind of like splattered or diseased skin. And, you know, thinking about pushing scale too. So this is, this is one of my largest paintings. It's like four and a half feet tall, which is like big for me. But, you know, thinking about this kind of close up cropped in body taking up a lot of space. So what does that mean when this, um, this kind of like sexualized figure is larger than life? And continuing to push color and light in my pieces, um, playing with pattern on top of pattern and kind of pattern on these like simple compositions, using the embroidery decoration to flatten and render the body underneath. And I was, I was once asked by someone like, Kat, you know, what's up with all the butts? Um, and I like was kind of taken aback and then I thought about it and butts are like basically this great grid. You know, they're simple and symmetrical and pretty like ge geometrically neutral. They're banal and yet they're so loaded with history, sexuality, Freudian psychology and middle school jokes. They're hilarious and contested, sexualized and soiled, pocked and buffed and mocked and lusted. So the butt, for me, becomes this wonderful blank slate on which different narratives can be built, whether it's adorned with lace, 
a metallic embroidery. Here are stripes of metallic thread curving around the figure. Or poked, hairy, scratched, and raw. I love that this one space can hold so much meaning. And it's also just kind of dumb and funny, and like that's good enough for me, too. It's, it's OK to pain in the butt every once in a while. Um, in this piece from last year, I really wanted to play with pattern on pattern on pattern. Um, in this painting, I started with a floral printed silk and then created a mole patterned back with the lace as the final layer, both revealing and concealing its wear. I like these magic eye-like spaces of optical confusion when it's often difficult to focus on the subject, when looking too long can actually become more confusing. And some of my favorite comments are when people are looking at the painting and they ask me, like, what am I looking at? And I really appreciate that kind of um, that confusion and where people are like really trying hard to find something that they just can't see yet. It's kind of searching for a body. And this one, I, I really just wanted to make a meat painting. Um, I, I was loving this kind of swirly patterns of the marbled beef. And I also made this leading up to the 2020 election and I was starting school in a pandemic and I just kind of felt like raw meat. So this felt, this felt um, appropriate. And this is all painted silk crepe de chine and then the knife is embroidered. These are some newer drawings. So continuing to kind of work with the figure using light, shadow, and architecture to distort and abstract the body. Introducing different types of patterns. So I've been in kind of like a wood grain phase lately, having a lot of fun with that. And also pools. I share Emmy's love of pools. Um, having fun playing with new patterns, colors, and light. And I loved the challenge of portraying something in motion. Here the light reflected at the bottom of the pool. Or here this, I didn't know, label this, this is um, dyed silk with the embroidered smoke coming out of a cigarette. Um, I just loved how the wet, like as you're doing, does anyone do silk painting in here? Or ever done it? Like one person, cool. So as the as the dye is drying kind of on the silk, it just like naturally takes on this kind of like cloudy, smoky um, space. So it felt really like inherently um, like a smoker's lounge to me. And I just loved the idea of kind of having to like very carefully, painstakingly stitch this like thing that's so ephemeral on top of it. Um, this is another new painting, and this is a nod back to my earlier text piece um, called Okay. And again, thinking about that duality of language. So just do it as both the Nike slogan and also as a statement of surrender. And when I was making this piece, I had both just hired a personal trainer and I had started chairing my foundations department at the art school in the middle of the pandemic. So the phrase, just do it, resonated with me both as a statement of strength and as one as a reminder just to fucking get through the semester. Just do it. And these pieces are so new, they're fresh, hot off the press, hot off the embroidery hoop, that they haven't even been, been stretched yet or properly photographed, so I apologize for the bad photos. But um, these are a couple um, crotch studies that I'm doing, so really kind of indulging, again, like in the zooming in and abstracting of the body, really indulging in some color and, um, yeah, different ways of kind of like thinking about abstraction, almost to the point where the body is completely removed. And another one, this is all raw silk. I apologize for not labeling them. Raw silk with the, the satin stitch on top and the lines. And if you are interested at all, I brought some like pieces that haven't been stretched yet if you want to fondle them afterwards. It's always fun. <laughs> How am I doing on time? Great. Great, okay. Um, I would just like to quickly digress and talk about boredom for a minute because it's been a truly necessary and integral part of my practice. Boredom propels you forward. It forces you into places of uncomfortability and opportunity. Boredom ultimately led me to silk painting and I have been here ever since. While I was living in New York City, I found out about classes you could take, like evening classes at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And I had been like hitting a wall in my own studio practice, so I randomly like picked up an FIT catalog and chose this, like the one class that could, could fit into my schedule and it happened to be silk painting. Um, more like contemporary silk painting. So if you just do a Google image search of silk painting, this is the first thing that's gonna come up. 
Um, it's often a bit dated with these really bright colors. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it's often meant to like kind of adorn the body in the form of like a, a scarf or a shawl. Um, the instructor's assignments in the FIT class really forced me to think about pattern in the body in new ways. So this is a silk scarf for a neck that has no head. Uh, I could be really funny and subversive with them. Um, this is like severed fingers and then fingernails kind of in the, floating in the space. And I was also in a class with a bunch of like 19 year old fashion design students. So I was like really having a lot of fun being the weird older one. <laughs> um, but most importantly, it got me back in. <laughs> I love this face. Um, the nipples are embroidered too, which is really, yeah, I like this face. Um, most importantly, it got me back into painting and forced me to think about color, texture, surface, and materiality differently. I could be playful with the silk, you know, using this material that we usually associate with luxury, softness, fragility, and I could subvert it with humor, perhaps the unexpected. You know, bodies that ooze, pockmarked skin, unshaven hairs, awkward and intimate moments. This all somehow felt more funny and strange on silk than it would on paper or canvas. Another aspect of boredom is just the sheer workload that it requires to finish things. And I'm talking to a bunch of fiber artists and printmakers, so I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, I just, as a personality, I'm naturally drawn towards tasks that are extremely time consuming, um, like painting tiny hairs over and over again, or just like endless chain or satin stitches. And I think back to Agnes Martin a lot and her tiny, perfect little grids. The execution of these required an exactitude extreme patience, and meditative monotony. And in reading Nancy Prinsenthal's wonderful biography of Martin titled Agnes Martin, Her Art and Life, I was not so surprised to discover that Agnes Martin was an accomplished swimmer. She attended the University of Southern California on a swimming scholarship and just barely missed the 1936 Olympic team. And this piece here reminds me of the tiles at the bottom of the pool. And I wasn't surprised by this because as an avid swimmer myself, I know the monotony and solitude of the pool, not to mention the grid. For me, swimming is a beautiful combination of boredom and the constant reminder of my own body. In the memoir of distance open water swimmer, Diana Nyad, she talks about passing the time in her 53 straight hours of swimming from Cuba to the Florida Keys by counting to 100 in English, German, French, and Spanish over and over and over and over again. But listen, we all have our ways of passing time, and while I could maybe make it to 100 in German, I wouldn't get far in French or Spanish, but luckily, I've got my good friends Hulu, Netflix, and Audible to keep me going. So while boredom is important in generating change, you also have to find ways to fight it, to keep going. This is an older picture I took of my studio. You can see a painting in process, my palettes of dye, very disgusting looking dye, and forensic files. I've watched countless TV shows, movies, audiobooks, and I wouldn't make the work that I do if I didn't. And a happy byproduct of this is that I've conditioned myself to need to be doing something with my hands while I watch TV now, so it's actually increased my productivity. So I found myself in a true codependent relationship of art and, ent and entertainment. Don't let everyone, anyone give you shit for watching too much TV. It's the takeaway. I'm just gonna drink some water. Okay. Lastly, I would like to address fiber as a medium and why I'm drawn to these materials. This is also another excuse for me to show you some of my favorite artists. I think fiber art often gets the wrong reputation. And just to be totally like upfront, like I, when I've given this part of the talk before, it's been to non-fiber students. So um, sorry if you guys like know all this already. Um, I think fiber art often gets the wrong reputation. Some might often think of it as pretty, comfortable, sweet, cute, decorative, which it can be, and it is. In silk painting especially, there is a style. And in my work, as I hope I have shown you, I'm trying to buck that style. I think about silk not as a decorative thing to be worn on the body, but rather being about the body, to reflect the body's innate complexity and sometimes filth. 
There was this great New York Times article um, a couple years ago called Some of the Most Provocative Political Art is Made with Fibers by Leslie Cammy. And this is a quote from the article where she's talking about the ubiquity of textiles. Textiles, after all, accompany us on nearly every step of life. We are born and swaddled, we are buried in shrouds, and most of us are even conceived between sheets. And I'm, a, I'm attracted to that duality of fiber, that it can be both comfortable and swaddle, but also soak up stains. Fibers inherently take on the body as part of its history. Here's Sarah Lucas again in her stained mattress. The stains is a visual residue of the body, the relic of a relationship. And before the precious Shroud of Turin, allegedly depicting the bodily residue of the buried Jesus. This is a quilt from the Guise Ben Group, a black community of quilters in Alabama and Mississippi who would use the scraps of their husbands, brothers, fathers, and sons discarded denim to create these beautiful quilts. These quilts show the residue of bodies at work, the faded knees once soaked with the sweat and stains of labor. I think another reputation fibers get is that they are often small, dainty, easy to fold and store away. This is an image of Faith Wilding's web room from the 1972 Intervention Woman House at Cal Arts. Here she has laboriously created a space that acts as an exploded afghan, a space of comfort, but also a web in which to trap prey. Or Magdalena Abakanowitz's massive woven sculptures. They create an ominous and imposing form, visually somewhere between a vagina and an alien spaceship. They are not pretty, coquettish forms, but rather large, sagging folds, ready to eat us whole. These are the large, hand-woven and hand-dyed tapestries of artist Erin Riley. Here, Riley uses the tradition of loom weaving to create her own dirty narratives. Though woven in soft wool, they depict nothing of comfort or softness, but rather a dirty and contemporary feminism through her very intimate self-portraiture. I also appreciate Riley's work for the sheer physical labor involved, that to make this work, she must strain her body in order to depict her body. It is doubly uncomfortable. These are the embroidered drawings and paintings by the Egyptian artist Gada Amer. She uses source imagery of both Disney princesses and pornography, repeated and stitched together to create these abstracted female forms. When she is sewing into the canvas, she purposefully leaves the ends of the threads, which drip down the surface, creating this oozy effect, perhaps mimicking tears or blood. She leaves the underbelly exposed. Those threads that are usually cut away and discarded are put on full frontal display in an act of dirty defiance. And I think of embroidery itself as kind of a bodily act. Unlike painting, embroidery is an invasive mark a poking and suturing of surface, like tattooing skin. This is the contemporary artist Erica Mah Mahane. Um, she's a very young painter, and from afar her works resemble minimalist paintings, but they are actually sewn in stretched silks, nylons, and canvas. She chooses colors and textures that mimic the human form, pinks and browns and peachy yellows that resemble skin or organs, and the nature of the silk itself is transparent. So we, do, so we see the skeleton of the stretcher bars beneath it, further illustrating its bodily nature. And upon closer inspection, we see smeared wax, which looks like the greasy, oily residue of human touch or bodily fluids. And her titles too suggest the figurative and intimate nature of her works. Finger holes are sewn into the surface, inviting the viewer to penetrate or violate the image. As the title suggests, one is able to slip in. This is an image I took in my studio a couple years ago after drawing my palette of silk dye on the floor. This dye once contained in a palette and handled oh so carefully with my tiny brush in a matter of seconds resembled a crime scene or a surgery floor. And it reminded me again of the reasons that I love silk painting, that the materials themselves are great stand-ins for the body. They are both delicious and disgusting. Silks that resemble the surface of skin, dyes as bodily fluids, 
hot burning wax as some cosmetic nightmare, and needles and thread as an invasive poking mark. It's also a good reminder that shit gets messy. Studios, bodies, relationships, school, the art world. Sometimes the best thing you can do is spill your stuff and embrace the disaster. So here's to getting messy and making weird things.